The subject of this panel is systemic risk, systemic regulation, banking post-financial crisis. And we have a great panel of experts to discuss this topic that could hardly be more important. You know, how is our financial system uh, working? Is it now um, fit for purpose uh, as we come out of this terrible uh, global crisis of two years ago? Um, our first speaker is going to be Paul Wilmot, a writer, expert in derivatives um, and financial innovation. Um, next speaker will be Joseph Wambia, who is uh, the principal of Wambia Capital Group, uh, who invests in Africa. Um, then we have Dr. Charles Calamaris of Columbia University, uh, one of the leading academic thinkers about banking. And then last but not least, uh, Josh Wolf of Lux Capital, uh, another investor, particularly in physical sciences. Um, and I really want to start, Paul, with this question of, you know, we've had this sort of extraordinary trauma of the global financial collapse, um, unprecedented government involvement in rescuing the system, and then all sorts of activity around the world trying to, you know, put Humpty back together again. Um, you know, most recently, the sort of Basel Accords have come out and um, you know, been greeted with, you know, some enthusiasm in the press as this is finally something being done. Um, so how's the, how does the system look to you? Does it look like it's getting back in the sort of shape it should be? Is the regulation well, the, the sort of regulation we want? The regulators are always uh, playing catch up um, with, with the, the bankers and they don't move as fast as the innovation moves. The, the latest thing since I was, I was here last time, uh, the, the big news is about this thing called high frequency trading. Uh, I don't know if, if people know what high frequency trading is. It, it, it means that uh, instead of individuals making decisions about um, what to buy and what to sell, it's the computers that are, uh, they have some black box, some algorithms, and the computers are now trading uh, amongst themselves with, with little uh, human involvement. And it's called high frequency because instead of like in the old days where you'd, you'd think for a, you know, a few weeks maybe about ponder what stocks to buy and sell, and then you'd, you'd um, leap in and then you'd, you'd hold them for months. With high frequency trading, you may be holding positions for seconds. And this is, this is starting to have potential for um, distorting the, the markets in all sorts of ways which I, I can go into. And, and th this is just an example of the, the main problem really is, is bandwagons. We had uh, bad bandwagons with, with um, housing and all these uh, collateralized uh, fancy financial products that everybody was jumping into. And now everybody is jumping into um, high frequency trading. And the reason why bandwagons is, is bad, or, or a bad thing, uh, because um, the, the, there's a potential for feedback, and here I, I speak as a, as a mathematician, I'm sure uh, physicists um, listening to this, and mathematicians, but feedback just means that, that you, 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 there's some action, which, uh, which well, let's, let's, let's take the example of the, uh, the famous example, is the 87 stock market crash. There was a thing in those days called uh, uh, dynamic portfolio insurance, which is a, a nice idea that if you're worried about the, the, your portfolio and how it will behave if the market falls, then what do you do? Well, you could, um, you could just close out your portfolio now, but then what if the, the market doesn't fall? You've just missed on you know, a, a rally and just missed on making lots of money. So some clever chaps came up with the idea that what you do is as the market falls a little bit, you sell a little bit according to some algorithm, according to some formula that's actually related to option theory. Uh, of course, if the market falls a little bit, then, and a lot of people are following this, this strategy that the formula says, well, now you've got to offload a little bit of your portfolio. Well, the offloading of that little bit of the portfolio then causes the market to fall a little bit more. Uh, and then your formula says, sell a little bit more, which causes the market to fall a little bit more. And it, it, faster and faster, next thing you know, you, you've got a 20% fall in the S&P index. This, this is um, October uh, 1987. So now you can have positive feedback. You can have neg negative feedback. Positive feedback exacerbates volatility, negative decreases it. Uh, so bandwagons, latest one being high frequency trading, you, there's a potential for this, this sort of thing to happen much faster than ever before. Now you've, you've also got, you thrown into this pot the wonderful thing called moral hazard. And you, you can, as I say, you can have positive feedback, you can have negative feedback. Well, 
uh, what do the hedge funds want? They may say, oh, it's, we're actually, I've got negative feedback, feedback. we're decreasing volatility. Well, uh, I, I don't think so, because the, um, uh, all the hedge funds, that's the last thing they want, is, is lower volatility, because if there's no volatility, then any idiot can um, you know, make money in the stock market. So th they actually want to cause positive feedback. Uh, so very unpleasant. And of course, you, you no doubt all know about the, um, the, the famous flash crash of, of May the 6th. Uh, we had a, a general election in, in the UK on, on that day, and um, uh, so I was a little bit preoccupied watching that. But uh, over here, there was, for example, Accenture went from whatever it was, 40 odd dollars, down to, to five cents in a matter of minutes. And fortunately, it bounced back up again, and the exchanges cancelled all the trades. Uh, but that was a caused by the computers um, fighting out amongst themselves, not, not real people. And ever since then, there have been, been smaller flash crashes. Uh, and eventually, the time will come when this, this feedback will, will cause a crash that doesn't bounce back. In so, I mean, what you're describing is a, a world that feels like it's no safer, no more well-run. Yeah. Than before the crash, that it's, it's all exactly this, the same. All this effort has well, it's, it's just it's, it's moved somewhere else. And uh, I, I speak to the, the various um, uh, regulator types about what what can they do. They're, they're all everyone's worried about the high frequency trading and what it could could do. The potential. I'm not saying it will cause the next uh, crisis. I mean, it just feels. I mean, I mean, high frequency trading feels to me much more <laughs> like noise within the system rather than something that has the power to bring the whole system down in a way that. The massive leverage across the subprime. Well, it, what if it does? It, what if it's not restricted to a, to a handful of stocks like it was uh, on May the sixth? What happens when it, it, it happens all across the board? The the, the the people who are making money from from this, it's, it's a bandwagon. People are making lots of money. They know that they've got a very small window of opportunity. Essentially, uh, it won't even be it won't even be years if if regulators can get their act together. It may be six months before something is put in place. So they're desperately trying to get as much money out of the system as possible before moving on to the next bandwagon. Okay. Well, Joseph, um, I'm sure we're going to come back to talk about that more. But Joseph, I mean, is Africa the next bandwagon? And much short-term volatility there, or is it the the long-term volatility of Africa that we're worried about? Well, I, th I think um, Africa is already becoming the next bandwagon. There, we're seeing substantial capital flows moving into Africa from uh, the developed markets. And in fact, our firm is very much in the middle of that uh, activity. And um, one of the real concerns for Africa is that uh, hedge fund money and institutional money that comes in with very high volatility and velocity would over overwhelm the markets and cause bubbles. Mm -hmm. And um, the history has been uh, a bit unfortunate that they all come in at the same time and they all want to get out at the same time. That's not possible with African markets. They are thin, thinly traded markets, they are shallow markets. The regulators don't have the uh, wherewithal to, uh, to stem the inflows and the outflows. And so, um, uh, it's a real concern, and one of the things that uh, we are doing about it, uh, first of all, is to try to provide more education and to interact with institutional investors, but more, more importantly, um, our experience uh, and the experience of many other uh, more advanced markets, middle, in middle income markets, uh, China, Brazil, for example, is that when, when um, a broader, uh, less, uh, concentrated um, a group of investors, meaning the public, for example, through mutual funds, are investing in these markets, you have less volatility. The, it's longer play. Uh, Africa is a long-term long investment market. It's not one that you can go in and come out. The transaction costs become enormously high, and the damage that one does to the economy can be quite severe. Having said that, um, the perception of risk in Africa is a lot more uh, extreme than the reality. Um, the, the, uh, the returns to investing in Africa and African markets have been, um, to, say, to say the least, phenomenal. The people who've lost money in Africa are hedge funds that go in and buy when uh, there's more beta than there is alpha, and they all want to come out at the same time. If you're selling to one another or selling to nobody, uh, it follows that the price is going to be low. But long-term investors uh, have a lot to gain. 
and have made a lot of money in Africa. I mean, it's been one of the interesting um, stories coming out of the crisis that, in a way, the developing economies, the good things that were going on in developing economies seem to have, you know, in terms of market development and so forth, seems to have you know, actually been relatively little affected by the crisis. Some of the development issues at the bottom of the, you know, in terms of poverty and food and, and so forth, have, have been badly affected. But the growth story for, uh, for corporations and, and stock markets has continued quite fast. I mean, do you think the system is, you know, it, it has, is healthy? Is, it, is, is this the kind of global financial system that is going to uh, actually provide the long-term growth capital that Africa and other developing economies need? Yes. Um, Africa is today, and we're speaking about Africa as a continent, it's not a place, uh, but broadly speaking, Africa is where um, East Asia and the Pacific were in 1980, economically uh, speaking, with much, much stronger fundamentals across the board. Uh, there are weak, weak spots ev everywhere, like any other, any other large region, but broadly speaking, uh, fiscal house is in order uh, for, for a change. Having a young population is a strategic and competitive advantage uh, of a very long-term nature. Um, young, productive, low cost. They used to be young, dependent, but now it turns out having a young population is a real advantage for developing countries, and Africa has a very young population. Uh, and a, for, and also another difference is that Africa's growth is increasingly <coughs> internally driven rather than export driven entirely, although it's supported obviously by, uh, by the um, uh, commodity price boom, that, that's a different topic. But African economies are growing internally. African governments have gone through uh, 10 or 15 years of structure adjustment. And you know, I, I was privileged uh, in, in my career at the World Bank to be in, involved heavily in some of that. And that's paying off. Uh, some of the pain that uh, African countries went through uh, is inconceivable in any advanced country. No, no, you, know, it's, uh, you can see, for example, in this country, you, you can hardly even get 1% uh, of that level of pain to go through politically. The political economy doesn't allow that. So Africa is reaping the benefits of that. And finally, one of the real um, ironies and benefits of being um, marginalized somewhat. Africa is more integrated in the global economy now than ever, but it is still not as tightly linked as other countries or other economies. That turned out to be a benefit with the financial crisis. That, uh, that hurricane, uh, as much as it wanted to come into Africa, it, it just couldn't come in because the link just wasn't there to fully transmit the, the havoc and the shock. Now, some of those effects are coming in lately, but we are, we are seeing Africa's uh, growth in Africa coming down from 6 7% pre-crisis to 3% during the crisis and headed back to 6% now. And uh, a good majority of African countries, uh, due to improved governance, good economic performance, investment in infrastructure, uh, you're looking 7 10% across you know, quite a number of important countries. So the future is very hopeful for Africa, and uh, those of us who've been involved in development and particularly in capital markets, are uh, seeing signs everywhere. And, and just finally, one of the, the real, uh, the shift is going to have to be from development assistance, uh, which has played its role, a very critical role, to market-driven, cap, uh, market uh, capital market-funded development. And, and this is where the advanced countries, the United States and Europe, for example, have to play a role in supporting the development of African capital markets from the ground up, not from the top down, but from the ground up. Uh, the models that were top driven have all failed. But, but fortunately, this change is already happening in a very, very per, you know, uh, pervers, um, uh, persistent way across the continent. So we're very optimistic. So Charles Kalmaris, I mean, two years ago, we were, we were all sitting here thinking the world had come to an end. Um, you know, the financial system had cataclysmically melted down and only been saved by government intervention on an unprecedented scale. I mean, so what, what have we learned since then? What about how to have a sound banking financial system? Have the regulations that have been put in place actually made the system safer? What, what remains to be done? <coughs> I think the first thing that we learned was what we already should have known, which is 
banking systems are central to both the development process in finance and to systemic stability. Uh, we've been talking so far in the panel about securities markets and hedge funds, and they can be helpful, but no country has ever developed except with its core banking system in operation. So in particular in Africa, from a developmental standpoint, we have to get middle market lending to work. That's what's going to work, not hedge funds uh, very interested. But if they bring a lot of money and they're just chasing a few investments, they have to come, as you said, from the bottom up. And that means the domestic banking system. And, when, and what we've learned from the crisis is that's not an easy thing to get right. In fact, historically, around the world, it hasn't been an easy thing to get right, and particularly because uh, the same kinds of financial systems that, uh, that blow up when you look in uh, developing countries also tend to have very thin amounts of banking relative to GDP. So from a developmental standpoint in, in a region like Africa, this is a very salient lesson. Now, of course, in the U.S., what we learned is that uh, this problem is fundamentally a problem of the lack of proper budgeting of capital relative to risk. Let me reinforce this. This was not bad luck. This was not just a black swan or whatever people like to say. This was a very clear, ex ante, demonstrable, excessive risk in the system relative to budgeted capital to absorb that risk. And that, I think, is a very important lesson because what it means is we have to have deep reforms to prevent that from continuing to happen. What, what does it mean to have deep reforms? There are two dimensions of it. Uh, one dimension is the mechanical dimension of measuring risk on a forward-looking basis effectively and credibly and budgeting capital accordingly. That's a mechanical aspect. The other aspect, which we found is very important, is creating incentives within financial institutions to manage and measure their risk and budget capital themselves. That is, we can't just depend on setting up regulations to measure risk. We have to do that and budget capital accordingly. But we also have to be thinking about deeper incentives because some institutions, a very long list of them, Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, HSBC, Standard Charter, BBV, Bank Santander, I could go down the list, managed pretty well, Credit Suisse. Other institutions have, I would say, managed their risk very poorly on an ex ante basis. Citibank, Merrill, UBS, Bear Stearns, uh, uh, Lehman, and AIG. And so we, we learned it's not just the mechanical aspects of regulation, but something about the way you create incentives for proper risk management within these institutions. So I, now you mentioned Basel. Uh, I think that it's completely ineffectual so far. Uh, one of the most laughable aspects of the Basel Accord that was announced just last week was that the equity capital tier one standards that were just agreed were satisfied perfectly by Citibank, the worst offender. So, and by Lehman Brothers. Yeah, so, well, actually, I, I don't know if that's true. I think they had 11% tier one capital. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not, not sure, but certainly City. So what we know is that the rules that were just agreed would not have stopped what we just experienced. So um, maybe we'll have a little bit more time to talk about it. So I have a list of some fresh ideas for a few things that would make a difference if we have the political will to do it. And I think that's really the question. Does the... Uh, G7. But just before you say that, I mean, the, you, you talked about Basel, but I mean, the whole FinReg, you know, 2,300 pages of oh, congressional legislation, is that any of that useful at all? No, actually, it's, it's cutting the wrong way. It, it avoided doing some things that needed to be done that would have been effective, and it actually, in my view, contributed to the problem, and I, I can explain more, but yeah. uh, maybe when we come back to, to talk more about the details. But I think we have to get real that the, the crisis we just lived through is not just bad luck. Uh, it was telling us very clearly when we look at which companies went wrong and which didn't, that there were clear ex ante errors being made. And we have to ask, what was it about the incentives and what was it about the regulatory system that produced that? And then what that 2,300 page monstrosity that Congress just passed and the Basel agreements that were just signed do not get us far any, any way down the road to dealing with this problem. So Josh, um as an investor, how does this all sound to you? Do, does it make you want to run and put all your money in gold like uh, George Soros and uh, John Paulson are doing because they, they think the whole system, currency system and everything is so uh, full of risk that gold is the only 
really safe haven, or do you, do you actually feel more confident about the world now and more able to invest? Yeah, so we, we tend to, or we do invest more in shiny bright ideas rather than shiny metals. Uh, entrepreneurs, you know, that said that the best way to predict the future is to invent it, and that's who we back. We back the inventors of the future. A bunch of things that are said that I'm gonna try to, to tie together. I'll start with a philosophical view, and it's a little bit poetic. Um, we view basically three situations, and there's one in particular that we really look for. I call these respectively Fitzgerald, Twain, and Schopenhauer. Fitzgerald, famous quote, you know, the best way uh, to predict whether or not you've got a first-rate intellect is to hold two opposing ideas in your head at the same time and still retain the ability to function. And I think there's lots of domains in markets, uh, in political spectrums, where you basically have two cogent arguments on both sides of the debate, and the only certainty is the uncertainty and the volatility between both sides. So situations like gold. Is gold a great store of value or dollar alternative? Is gold nothing but a shiny metal? Inflation, deflation, China's the engine of growth. You know, China is a bubble waiting to collapse. And so those situations, I think the only thing that you can do is basically be along volatility between the two cogent arguments. One side will eventually prevail with empirical evidence post facto. Second situation, which is twain, is that it's not what you know uh, or that you don't know that kills you. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And that to me is what I'll broadly describe as banking, which I will describe in my next quote as the inverse of venture capital. You can call that the black swans, but these are basically things that everybody takes for granted. And the low probability, high consequence events when these things blow up are huge. And I do agree that incentives are a huge piece of this. I think the Romans had it right when, and I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, uh, when they built bridges, the bridge builder would have to actually stand under the arch stone when it was laid finally and when traffic went over it. And that was a great form of incentive to make sure that he was eating his own cooking. Uh, in venture capital, you know, those are the incentives that we have in place. An entrepreneur has to invest his own money. Uh, he is vested over time. The duration of the decisions that he's making matches the duration of the consequences of the outcomes. And I think that you had a failure of that in the recent system where, you know, I can get paid a lot of money if I worked at a bank and was constantly writing puts all the time and I would uh, generate a lot of top line revenue, but I would be incurring none of the long term risk. So I think that duration mismatch. Well, this is this great. Uh, phrase IBG, YBG, I'll be gone, you'll be gone. Exactly. Uh, which I thought really captured exactly. the mentality on Wall Street. So, so I think that that's a very interesting dynamic of understanding you know, the rewards that people are getting vis-a-vis -vis the risks that they are taking. And you need smart people to be able to analyze you know, what those long-term risks that people are really incurring. The third quote, which I love, which is Arthur Schopenhauer, German philosopher, which was that you know, talent is about hitting a target that nobody else can hit. Genius is about hitting a target that nobody else can see. That's what entrepreneurs do, right? So they come with arrogance of the highest order and say, this is what the world is gonna look like some years hence. And with their you know, uh, uh, galvanizing and, and, and zealot-like personalities, they're able to command capital and resources and people and, and invent that future. So that's really what we invent. The risk, anytime that we invest in a startup venture, equity capital, because none of these things are able to attract debt because they have no cash flows and no, no profits, uh, is that they fail. We lose 100% of our capital. But the systemic risk for venture capital is very low. Uh, Technologies can change, regulations can change, companies can change. The one constant through all this is human nature. And I think that no matter what, it's a good time in the economy, it's a bad time, there's always entrepreneurs. There are entrepreneurs inventing technologies, there are entrepreneurs inventing innovations around regulations. Uh, in many ways, you know, when you were talking about um, you know, being able to detect sort of um, uh, long-term risks, I think that there are just like a war on drugs, which we've effectively lost for 20 or 30 years, I think there's almost a war on risk. There's always smugglers. There's always people that are gonna find ways to obfuscate risk that are, are being uh, taken. So, um, so I would say incentives matter. Uh, my three quotes about the nature of uh, risks, venture capital being one that nobody is looking at, that Schopenhauer situation, right? It's a low probability, high positive consequence event, and those end up being you know, the Googles and the Ebays and the Yahoos and the Microsofts. The other thing which I'll tie into Africa, one would say, I would predict, okay, so this is a speculation, a year hence, we will see a crisis in venture capital in solar energy. Anytime that hype is high, the cost of capital gets low. As Buffett says, you pay a high price for a cheery consensus. In solar energy, there is a cheery consensus. You have, by our account, something like 140 venture-backed companies in Silicon Valley focused on solar energy. If history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. I think that the best proxy is global crossing, which itself could have been a crisis. On the hype of infinite bandwidth and telecom, you saw a great build-out flow of capital into telecom. The losers were the early entrepreneurs and the investors. The winners were the consumers, the third world in India, Africa, China that got connected to the internet. So by analogy, I speculate that 90 plus percent, I don't want to be bombastic about the number, are going to fail. Solar companies in the US are going to fail. And the winner will be some clever entrepreneur that goes to Africa and takes good enough assets developed by US, as one of my friends has said, in greed and avarice lies the hope of progress and builds what I call Africa Edison. 
So what will be a crisis in venture capital equity in the US will be the greatest unintended philanthropic boom to energy in Africa. Well, that's a big vision. Um, one of the things that I've been writing about for this week's Economist is, is, you know, is Obama bad for business? And I've been talking to business person after business person that says, oh, you know, he doesn't get us. Uh, don't know whether we're going to invest or not. All that sort of thing. From the point of view of people in venture capital who are really doing the, you know, the visionary investing, has has that been has that process been affected at all by the current sort of risk aversion mood that's out there in societies in general, or are you sort of carrying on regardless? So I, I think broadly people are carrying on. I think the points where you can say where is there uncertainty because of government regulation, uh, some in taxation, some in energy policy. But I would just say then, you know, it behooves the manager to say, I'm not going to invest in an area where I'm relying on large government subsidies or programs for energy, you know, as a means of non-dilutive financing against the business that we're growing. So by and large, I think entrepreneurs say, here's a huge problem. A huge problem represents a huge opportunity. Let's go and change the world. You know, arrogance of the highest order. And it's almost like Tom Wolfe said, you know, why don't you ever write about politics? And he basically said, look, you have both parties. America's basically on a train. And you know, they're throwing pies and punches at each other inside the train, but we pretty much continue along track through all kinds of crises. So I think people will emotionally overweight you know, Obama being anti-business, and uh, you know, venture capitalists will try to rail against carried interest you know, being an a, a, a ordinary income, which I think it should be. I think that's fair. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah. entrepreneurs but, will continue. And the same applies to what happened with the broader global financial system two years ago as well, or, or was that more You know, it's amazing more? because many of our limited partners, um, we were lucky we didn't have any defaults on capital calls, you know, despite their exposure. So that was a systemic risk to us, right? People that were exposed to venture capital, when we called down their money, if they were in other things, illiquid things, they were not able to meet capital. We got lucky. I think most venture capital, uh, by and large, didn't have that problem. Uh, the one interesting thing that I would say globally is we need to sell our companies to somebody, to a strategic buyer. We need to sell our company to retail investors in a public market. And where will that capital come from? So, you know, I broadly believe the Riston quote that capital goes where it's welcome and stays where it's well treated. Uh, U.S. IPO market has been dead for 10 years. So who's going to buy stakes in startups? It hasn't been the U.S. One could argue that the influx into debt uh, capital markets, into treasuries and bonds in a huge way, eventually people will recognize they're taking, you know, 1%, 2.5%, 3.5% 3 respectively on a 2, 10, and 30 year yield. And they'll start looking probably for large cap US equities that are paying dividends that exceed those bonds. And then eventually, once those things get priced up, there'll be a little bit of equity lust and people will go into smaller cap issues. And we may get lucky, speculation, and you will see an IPO boom. Whether that happens in the US or in foreign markets for the first time, really, uh, I have no idea. But I do believe that globally there will be demand for unlevered high growth companies and the source of unlevered high growth companies are venture capital portfolios. Great, well I'm gonna start going back to Charles now to really get your agenda for what you think you know, remains to be done to get the system fixed and maybe talk about some of your ideas then we'll discuss that amongst the panel. Well, I, I wanna come back to the idea that there really are two different things we have to worry about. One is just getting the mechanics right of a prudential system for measuring risk on a forward-looking basis accurately, and then secondly, creating incentives uh, f that, that are robust so that people aren't going to be able to effectively game those rules and, in fact, will proactively want to manage risk better. So I want to just list five ideas. And um, I want to say I'm very optimistic about this list because one of the things the crisis has given us is what I perceive to be a consensus among people who spend a lot of their time worrying about this, that this is pretty much the list. Uh, there's some items on here that are more controversial than others. Now, one item that's a very old one, which the Basel Committee, for some reason, has just not been able to get into their head, uh, is to budget capital according to the interest rates on, on the loan. Now, this is a very simple idea. The Argentines have been doing it for a long time. So in Argentina in the 1990s, the minimum capital requirement was 12%. But if you could have a capital requirement as high as 55%, depending on the interest rate on, on your loan. If we had budgeted capital on the basis of the all-in future interest rates on subprime loans, we would have had hugely higher capital. We would have looked at them and said, those are risky loans, irrespective of what the ratings agencies said or the banks said, and we would have budgeted a lot more capital. That's a tried and true method that simply ignored by the fancy Basel and Federal Reserve sorts of thinking. Secondly, what about the ratings agencies? Now the key problem with the ratings agencies is 
that their incentives are to accord with the buy side. The buy side are the ones regulated by ratings. Ratings have big costs for the buy side in terms of capital requirements and other uh, investing uh, limits. And so the, the buy side has been a constituency in favor of ratings inflation. So for example, a triple B CDO tranche uh, in 2005, before the boom in CDOs, had a, a five-year default risk at that time of 20% compared to a 2% five-year default probability for triple B corporates. People knew ex ante that these ratings were inflated. How do you solve this problem? Well, it's very simple. If you're going to provide a regulatory used rating, it has to be quantitative. It has to be a forecast of default probability, not a letter. And then it has to have a standard error associated with it. And then if the ratings agency consistently is inflated so that the, the uh, realized loss is much greater than the predicted one, then it has to have a sit out as an NRSRO. Very simple idea, which I proposed. Actually, Barbara Boxer took it up, tried to get it added to the Dodd-Frank bill, but couldn't because the buy side lobbied so hard against it. They like having loose regulations, and they know who to pay in Congress to get them. Uh, third idea, which is gaining a lot of traction, contingent capital certificates. Now, this not only creates a form of debt, which because it credibly bears haircuts during loss periods. So you better just explain what a contingent. Yes. Contingent capital is a form of capital in addition to equity capital that would be required by large financial institutions that would be a debt that would convert to equity if the weakness of the institution was sufficient. So you could trigger it based on a decline in the market value of equity relative to total value of assets, for example. Uh, and this is something, there's a lot of consensus forming around this. It has three advantages. One of them is a measurement advantage, which is because that debt is really at risk now, it won't be bailed out by construction. It can't be bailed out. Then it gives real signals about the riskiness of the institution being provided by people who have their money at risk. Secondly, uh, it also, during bad states of the world, reduces some of the debt service pressure on these institutions. But most importantly, as Goldman Sachs recommended, or recognized when it recommended this idea last year, it creates a strong incentive for institutions to issue capital, equity capital, after they've lost, uh, they've, they've suffered some losses. And it's a long story to go through all this, but the point is it creates strong incentives for large institutions to manage their risk properly and to recapitalize after some losses in order to, therefore, avoid these too big to fail problems. Fourth idea, which is also gaining traction, is living wills. And again, living wills make a lot of sense for a lot of reasons, but one of the things- And weren't they in the uh, Dodd-Frank bill? To be, to be studied and reported on. But the, as in most things, and contingent capital certificates also to be studied and reported on. I could tell you a funny story about the Graham Leach, Dodd, uh, the Graham -Leach uh, bill, uh, where uh, we had a, a to be reported on list two, which never got properly handled. So I think that the answer is they punted on it. And uh, living wills, of course, by creating an orderly mechanism for transferring control of assets when financial institutions become insolvent, takes a lot of the subsidy away from these large institutions and, again, incentivizes risk management. The final thing, which uh, the Dodd-Frank bill got exactly wrong, is that we have to make sure that when those institutions become insolvent, that their creditors suffer some kind of minimum amount of haircuts. That is, we do not have a, a carte blanche to bail out creditors 100%. And the Dodd-Frank bill gives exactly the wrong signal because it provides that carte blanche, which will definitely be used. So it was a, a failure of leadership, I think, on that score. So these are five pretty basic ideas. What they all have in common is they provide cr credible incentive-based sorts of solutions to the problems of measuring risk and creating incentives for uh, the, the firms themselves to worry about their risk. That's the direction we have to go in. Why isn't Basel going in that direction? Because the fox is guarding the chicken house. Yeah. The institutions that don't want this kind of regulation are in charge, I, I would say, effectively of the Basel process and also Congress. So it's, it's really an issue of whether we can mobilize enough popular understanding of what's going on here to actually make these kinds of very tedious finance sorts of math discussions something that can energize voters and get people uh, interested. 
Um, I, I'm optimistic more than I have been in the past because of this consensus that's forming. So I, I think these are all intelligent ideas. I would actually, you know, Paul has an assemblage of some of the smartest people affiliated with Wilmot, and I would propose that somebody out there, I'm not gonna do it, put up a million dollar challenge. We'll pay you a million dollars if you, as the trader, as the quant, whatever, can figure out a way to beat each one of these things. Because immediately, I am not an expert in any of these. I've identified at least two ways for the first two, and I mean this totally respectfully, but as a, you know, interested party to make the system safer, budget capital according to interest rate on loan. Somebody could do forward swap agreements. They could borrow the budget capital piece itself. You have some systemic risk there. The rating agencies going from an alpha model you know, of letters to a quantitative model that people now see in number instead of a triple A, uh, you know, that's still a reliance on models that presume that they cover tail risk, which they don't. And um, I can imagine people designing around that. So I would give some brilliant guy that's out there, not me again, a million dollars to disprove it, create the same sort of incentives, create a competition that says, here's the five consensus proved things, kill it. Yeah, that's a very good idea, because that, that's exactly what the banks are doing anyway, the, the, the thinking of ways of getting around it, every single regulation that's ever been uh, put forward. I mean, is there any solution to that problem? I mean, in the sense that, I mean, banks, the incentives to actually get around the regulations are so powerful and regulators are always underpaid and... Yeah, the regulators don't, they're not educated anywhere near as, as well as the people in banks. And at this point, I have to mention that um, I probably educate more people in, in risk management, quantitative finance, etc., at a higher level than anyone else on the planet. And of the thousands of people that, that come through my programs, um, I think only starting in June was the very first ever regulator. They just, you know, they, they, and it's not that expensive, guys. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and what, but so as you, as you think about, you know, the problems potentially that that mismatch leads to, where you just have this highly motivated group of people with the ability to borrow pretty much unlimited amounts and take punts that are really about short-term rewards and not about the long-term interests of society. I mean, how would you... You know, if you would have had the misfortune to find yourself chairing the Senate Banking Committee, you know, what would you be trying to do to actually solve this problem? Well, I, I, I like the, the the ideas that, that Charles presented, and I also particularly liked the the thought that the the second one, the the ratings agency things, that the ratings agencies were getting upset. I mean, it's a, it's a good sign if, if that's happening. Was, I'm not sure about whether they're getting upset about the other ones. And so you, you probably, unless they're really good game players and they're kind of thinking another step ahead, uh, anything that gets them upset has got to be, um, you know, it's a clue. But I think, I mean, I think there's, there's one, there's one um, additional element um, to, to what um, uh, is being put on the table, and that is the control environment of the organization. And I think the ratings... Uh, rating agencies and anybody else who looks at uh, financial institutions looks first and foremost at the control environment, the culture. Uh, all the institutions that didn't fail had a control environment where the management and the staff had a long-term stake and interest to, to the success of the organization, a proud, um, a proud uh, sense of, of belonging, and uh, short-term uh, financial interest did not overwhelm, um, did not provide incentives for misbehavior. Well, One of the things I, mean, I did but, but surely Lehman Brothers is the direct opposite of that, where you had every, I mean, a, a gold-plated, everyone loved it, long-term incentive plan, massive amounts of ownership, I mean, Dick Fold, biggest, you know, sort of Well, but I, I think the, the control environment at Lehman Brothers allowed a leverage ratio of uh, 1 to 40 or 50, and and that's, that's just not a controlled organization. and. Uh, right, but doesn't that raise the point, though? That, I mean, even, something seems to have happened during that period where people who one might have thought had a very strong long-term self-interest in managing their risks sensibly didn't do so. Um, and yeah. that, 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 to, that, to me, begs a whole series of questions about, you know, how, how do we... Because, I mean, that's, that's where Alan, I, I think Alan Greenspan to, essentially yeah. said, the thing I got wrong... It also like, goes to the I level got of compensation. Wrong, ...was to assume that banks yeah. would act in their own self-interest. Can, can I jump in here? Uh, <clears throat> I think there are two stories out there. One of them we now know was wrong. It's not the right story. And the other one's looking every day more like the right story. One story is that the CEOs were, had excessive incentives for short-termism. Well, that turns out to be wrong, as you pointed out. But there's another story which we, we've been building on, which is middle-level uh, portfolio managers within organizations if they're not 
facing tough risk managers, chief risk officers within those organizations, will often face incentives to take excessive risk at the expense of the shareholders of that organization. Exactly. Yeah. It, and here's a, a new study that just came out by Yeramili, shows that the best predictor of the risk pro profile, at least within the commercial banking group, was the ratio of the chief risk officer's salary to the chief executive officer's salary. And it's really remarkable how, how well that variable works in regression analyses to predict effective risk management. James, let me go back to James and let you finish your point. Though, so. No, but, but I think um, um, he's, he's made my point even better than I could myself because when I, I, I was involved in, in, in the World Bank's risk management operation that, you know, if anything, you look at the kind of risk that the, the, the bank on the financial side takes uh, in financing development, and financing countries that are, you know, not that creditworthy. Uh, the most important thing that um, you want to do is to ensure that you have adequate capital. Uh, employees are paid well enough to incentivize them to serve the institution, but not so well, and and, the, and their personal income is not so directly linked to the. Um, to the activity that they, are, that they are involved in, that they will bet, uh, they'll put the institution at risk for their personal benefit. And when I was a portfolio manager for the bank, uh, auditing and reviewing the bank's global portfolio, the most pre uh, direct predictor of bad performance was the star performer who got promoted for delivering the largest amount of loans. There is a direct correlation. Four years later, the whole pack of cards collapses. He's now vice president, okay? And, uh, and you, you have to have a situation where um, you, you, the institution itself counts before the individuals. And so it, it's, it's a delicate balance between um, sufficient compensation to, to, make, to incentivize people to, to perform, but not so much that their personal interest is ahead of the institution. And when I meant, what I meant about the control environment where I was headhunted to go to, to Fannie Mae as audit director, and I set up their capital market shop, and I saw a pack of cards that were going to collapse any time. Thin capital, uh, incentives that were way out of proportion to the kind of uh, risks that uh, anybody could plausibly take. <clears throat> and the constant answer they gave me when I, was, I did the liquidity review and risk strategy, and they said, this is not the World Bank or in the private sector. You know, Individuals are taking risks, and they're compensated because they know best. Just the very opposite. Individuals in a large institution take risks at the, at, the, uh, at the risk of the institution. In a small institution, your personal wealth and your personal capital is at risk. You are the best person to take that risk because you lose personally. In a large institution, it's heads I win, tails everybody else loses. I'd go further than that. I don't even know why people in, in banks earn anywhere near as, you know, what they earn. It's, it's yes. for, for the job they do, yeah. to be honest. For the job they do. Well, I guess they're making profits, so I guess the profits have to be have to go somewhere, don't they? Well, uh, I know this oh, profits are uh, tide rising, and everybody's a genius when the tide is rising. Sure. And uh, the emperor had no clothes. The recession came, and all the models turned out to be fat tails where nobody had predicted fat tails. They were right there. It's not that you couldn't see them. And, uh, you know, every, the, the herd mentality essentially says, if I don't do what everybody else is doing, I'm going to lose out on the bonus. I'll, I'll be fired next quarter. Uh, and, it, you know, economics 101, if everybody's going over there, surely it's being inflated. At some point, there is an inflection point, and the question is, are you the one that's been caught without your underwear? And, um, you know, pretty many smart people get caught at, at the edge there, and you wonder, you know, it was pretty obvious. Um, the recession sure, did a lot of smart people. You, you know, the, the simple interesting test, I think, is we have thousands of people right now, from academics to practitioners, that can comment ex post facto, we can point out ex ante what could have been. I think the simple test is if the economist does a survey and says, where are the five vulnerabilities, the 10 vulnerabilities in the world? And it would be interesting, you know, Phil Tetlock, the academic, does a great job of this, of holding accountability to prognosticators, holding accountable the prognosticators and their predictions. It would be very interesting to see the world's leading thinkers, you know, everybody can predict municipal crisis or for-profit lending crisis or sovereign crisis or, you know, uh, uh, currency crises between one, revaluations. But it would be interesting if you take the smartest people, stack rank what they believe to be the next systemic crisis, the ones that need attention, and actually see in five years, 
when inevitably there will be another crisis. I don't know where it will come from. Who actually got it right? Can I jump in on this? So, you know, what's interesting to me is that the biggest ones in the last 15 years have actually been predicted. Um, Rudy Dornbusch predicted Mexico. I and, and many others predicted Argentina. By the way, The Economist had a special section, section on fragile Asian banking systems in April of 1997. And they said three countries, Korea, Indonesia, and Thailand, were going to have big twin crises on the order of losses of Mexico. But they were exactly right. They picked exactly the three, and they picked exactly what would happen. Um, I, I uh, prior to this crisis, gave a, a lecture to uh, a risk management association saying to them, how can you possibly model the risks of subprime the way you're modeling them? It doesn't make any sense. So I'm not saying we can forecast everything, but we can forecast a lot. Right now, we all are agreeing about what the next crisis is. The handoff from the private sector to the public sector has happened. The crisis right now has to do with sovereign debt, sovereign debt. in Europe. And also, I would say what we learned yesterday was the way the Federal Reserve can create an international for foreign currency crisis, which we are very much at risk of if the Federal Reserve completely ignores the effects of their quantitative easing pronouncements on foreign exchange markets. Those are things that, and I don't think it's a coincidence that you mentioned foreign exchange, right, today. Right, but these are all the known ones, and, and you know, again, True. We, we, we predicted that bin Laden would strike, you know, inside of the U.S., and given a large sample of, you know, 10,000, 100,000, a million predictions, statistically, one may be right, or, you know, there will be the guy that got the Argentine crisis or the guy that got, you know, 9-11 uh, right, or, uh, but if it's not acted on, if the decision makers aren't holding high the weighting of those predictions, you know, uh, there's thousands of predictions on blogs and Twitter and, you know, everywhere else, but uh, it doesn't matter if we don't do something about it. Noah can predict, you know, the flood, but if he doesn't build the ark, it doesn't mean nothing. Well, I'm going to ask each of you now, uh, give me a prediction for what the, the next big crisis will be in five years' time. James. I can't. <laughs> I think uh, it will be a credit bubble. Uh, the, um, the, 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 the massive uh, flows of um, funds into the bond market, uh, which is clearly inflated, um, that's going to have to come to an end. And uh, I think the big loss is going to come in, in that direction. Uh, domestically in the U.S., one, one really has to be concerned about uh, municipal bonds and state, state governments defaulting on their, on their debts. Uh, the, the rhetoric uh, would have you believe that uh, states are prudent and the federal government is, in, is imprudent. Uh, when you look at the tax basis of most states, uh, which is based on, on uh, property taxes and the, the fundamental uh, services that they provide, which are for education and um, uh, basically, I, I think education is the largest one. I'm forgetting what the others are. Uh, increasingly, states will be insolvent, and the political economy in the United States uh, doesn't allow for raising taxes, and it doesn't allow for cutting spending. Well, something is going to have to give. So, whereas the federal government um, can not only print uh, and incur deficits, and the Federal Reserve can 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 get out of uh, fiscal folly through senior age, states don't have that ability. And so I, I would, um, I worry about that. And in my business, I go about talking to people about investment opportunities in Africa, and and uh, they tell me Africa is very risky, and and that is also true. Uh, but the political economy of uh, both raising taxes and cutting spending, um, and level of leverage is much easier in 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 some most of the places I work in than in this country. It is just impossible to to get. Um, uh, well, well, that's a, that, uh, for someone who didn't have a prediction, that's quite a yeah. quite an <laughs> so that'll, that'll, that'll be my Charles, prediction. why don't you, you, yeah. you throw your prediction in? For there, there are too many. Uh, there are too many ones. Just pick I one. For five years. Well, um, the biggest. I want to talk about Europe. Um, I think that investors are wrong to be worried about Spain, and to equate Spain with Italy. Um, I think that uh, Greece is only doing about one third of what it needs to do to resolve its fiscal gap. Uh, but Greece is small enough that it can be pretty easily bailed out by the EU, which I think is what's going to happen given the way politics in Germany seems to be headed. So I, I think Greece will be bailed out. Portugal is also small and, if needed, will be bailed out. The big risk is coming, let's say, about two to four years from now, and it's coming in Italy. And Italy is a big country, and Italy is politically broken. And that's a very important fact because it doesn't have the political capability to fix itself. That technology is gone. 
By the way, let's look at Japan, too. Japan seems to have had technological regress in politics, too, and that's very worrying. But, uh, and China, I would say, is, a, is another place where the banking system, uh, hidden losses are gonna be huge. But, uh, you know, there's, there's just too many bad news stories out there. Uh, <laughs> I, would I would say, you, I would I would say Italy is the one that's going to surprise <laughs> people two to four years from now. It's going to be the thing that does most damage to the euro. So I think it's responsible. You always put a probability in a time frame with a prediction. And I would say in the next five years, there's a 20% chance that it has to do with uh, some domain where debt is excessive. It's likely that where that debt is excessive is unknown today. And I would say that 80% probability in the next five years that it comes from a source that nobody can predict. And so I'm humbled by my inability to predict and will predict that the next crisis comes from a confidence in the ability to predict what the next thing was and missing it. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good one. So whatever Nouriel Roubini says, you're gonna short, essentially. Is that the I, strategy? I, I think it's just, it's far better to live in domains where you can say, I don't know. Paul. I, I'm gonna go, for, I'm gonna plump for th three. Five years is a long time. So it's three different things. Um, I th think there'll, some, some China thing will be a long, slow, drawn out, something bad. Uh, I'm, I, I think high frequency trading is a possibility for something not so bad but very rapid. And I think that there's, a, that there's a, uh, an outside chance of something really, really, really bad, um, and that is cyber terrorism. Hmm. Right, well, we covered a lot of ground there, so I'm going to throw it open to contributions from the, the floor. We've got a gentleman in the middle there. If you say who you are before you ask a question. Uh, the mic's coming to you. My name is uh, Jihad al-Wazir. I'm a regulator, albeit a small, small country. And I was, my question to Charles about uh, BAL2, Basel, Basel 3 now. Uh, I mean, you have counter-cyclical buffers, you have uh, uh, raising the minimum uh, capital requirements, tier one capital, et cetera. If you look at the situation of the European banking system, it was you know, on the verge of collapse, really. And so what happened in, in Basel uh, and the G20 uh, that, that stabilized the situation. And I think, you know, with the counter-cyclical buffers, with the increase in capital and so on, uh, it's something good. So what's, what's, why the take on this that uh, what happened is not enough? Well, the, I don't think we did anything uh, in Europe that stabilized the situation other than effectively fiscalizing the losses. The stress test in, in Europe has been completely discredited. Uh, People know that. Do you think it was any better in America? Yes, I think it was slightly better. But in the, it, it, if you really knew what the stress test did in America, it didn't purport to do uh, that much. It was a cash flow stress test, not a present value stress test. In Europe, uh, the banks are surviving because they are basically wards of the state. Um, most of the, the effective reforms being envisioned and discussed right now, having to do with counter cyclical capital, um, are not implemented. There's been all that's happened so far is a promise to increase tier one. Liquidity requirements are still on the table. They're a good idea, not necessarily the way Basel's proposing them. There's a lot on the table that I'm hopeful about, uh, but Basel is not serious about implementing contingent capital. They're discussing it, but they're framing it in a way that will not work, that investors will not buy, and that will not happen. And therefore, they're, they're, they're sort of destined to fail on that. Um, they, they put out a liquidity requirement that was so draconian that they had to withdraw it immediately, and now they're saying maybe they'll come back to it in 2014. I've heard that song before. So I think Basel's just been an utter failure, and it's been an utter, utter failure now for uh, 20 years. Um, uh, I don't think they've done anything. Matthew, quick comment <clears throat> on uh, high-frequency trading. Somebody brought to my attention an interesting variant perception about high-frequency trading, again, an area not in my core bellywick. Uh, when you view high-frequency traders as these, you know, um, uh, as market makers, instead of you know uh, just profit-seeking, evil, quick-trading people, uh, you can view a large retail operation like Walmart or somebody else as a high-frequency trader. They don't keep their assets for long. They serve to take something, quickly sell it, quickly have turnover in their inventory, and so uh, you could see a secular change in high-frequency traders taking over the role of many of the market makers. But I don't know uh, what implication that view or that point of view of it has on stability of the system. Paul? Uh, the, the, another thing that, that worries me, uh, well, there's the, the feedback. Is there any sort of, it, with Walmart, is there any feedback into um, 
make something bad happen? That's, that's the question. I don't yes. know whether there is there or not, other than people buy lots of stuff they don't need. Um, but that's the, an individual's problem. It doesn't affect people. It's just not, not. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, um, the other thing is the, the, the relationship between value and price. As I, I said, when you, in the old days, you'd, you'd ponder a, a purchase and then you'd, 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 uh, you'd do your fundamental analysis, figure out what you think the company's really worth, and then, okay, I'm going I'm to buy that stock. It's, it's going places. Um, people I mean, don't care about that anymore. It, I mean, it's, it's just you, you, you sell it a, a millisecond after you bought the thing. Who cares about the value? Who cares if you cause a crash and people are out of jobs? Right. I mean, is the problem fundamentally financial innovation? Because you hear Paul Volcker say the only good financial innovation has been in the last 30 years has been the ATM machine. Um, and then you get a proposal like George, from George Soros saying that we should look at financial innovation like we look at pharmaceuticals. There should be the equivalent of an FDA that uh, tests them out and approves them, you know, and before they can ever come to the market. I mean, is, I, is I, that I, the answer to the... I, I prefer the, um, is it FAA or CAA, the, the, the sort of airplane... The uh, NT, the National model. Transportation Safety Board, I think, is, I is the one that... I know Andrew Lowe has been proposing that after a crash they go in and investigate that, that approach. Right. Well, I, I think of um, the banks as being like uh, airports and the planes as being like the, the fancy derivative products. Right. And, the, there are, yeah, it's not, you, you, there are certain types of planes that, that are improvements, but if you, if you looked at, if you, if you translated some of these fancy pr derivatives products into the equivalent aeroplane, it would look very, very strange, <laughs> and uh, no way would it fly. <laughs> I, I just want to say I think that's the wrong diagnosis. I think it's an incentive problem, as I was discussing. Yeah. The two most innovative financial systems in world history and eras in world history were the Dutch in the 17th century and the Scots in the 18th century. Everything that currently exists, I defy you to name, name one thing that currently exists that wasn't invented by one of the two of them. Neither of them had a financial crisis, which is quite well, remarkable. Well, the Dutch had the tulip mania. No, not really. Well, then we can have a longer talk about that. Um, actually, no, that, that, that has been discredited uh, as a sort of made-up crisis, uh, and I can talk to you more about that. Um, but it, it had nothing to do with the financial markets. And it, uh, as far as we know currently, based on research done the last 20 years or so, that didn't exist. So n no, the, uh, the, uh, what's really interesting about those two economies is they had everything. Um, the Dutch invented all the derivatives that we're currently using. The Scots invented uh, every aspect of banking, uh, credit lines of, from lines of credit to small denomination notes to interest on deposits uh, and to clearing houses for bank uh, operations. So it's, it's really, uh, which the Dutch also had for bills of exchange. Everything that we look at in the world today that we were relying on came from those two systems, and they were the most, they were the most stable systems of their time. Did the, they have subprime mortgage collateralized debt? They case? did not have that. Uh, but securitization actually uh, is a very old idea, uh, it, but there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. So I don't think it's innovation per se. Innovation's good. Incentives to risk, though, are the key. Good question there. Yes, um, I was wondering if you Could all... Could you say who you are as well? Oh, I'm uh, Jaime Cuevas Termodi. I'm a principal in financial engineering. Um, and uh, I just wanted to get your take on a prediction about what you think is going to happen to inflation in the next five years in the United States, given that the government of the United States is now, I believe, spending $5 for every three it takes in, in taxes, and the $2 it's borrowing most of it isn't coming from us dampening consumption, but rather the Fed buying bonds from the Treasury, i.e. printing money. Charles, do you want to go first on that one? Uh, I'm very worried. Uh, yesterday, the Federal Reserve did something unprecedented. It said that uh, it has a long-term inflation target, and it's higher than you thought. Uh, the previous thing that the Fed had said on this was Alan Greenspan. When the U.S. hit a 1% core inflation rate, Alan Greenspan made an announcement, we've hit our inflation target. That was the last thing a Fed official ever did. What they did yesterday updated that and said, basically told us that the Fed now has an inflation target of 1.5% to 2%. Uh, but more dangerous than that is the fact that they told us that they view inflation as a tool to combat unemployment. And that is very dangerous. But my biggest concern is not the Fed's willing uh, decision to inflate, but rather the arithmetic that, that will drive inflation if the government doesn't fix its deficits, because the Fed's independence is not uh, absolute. If the government simply 
uh, runs huge unsustainable deficits. Sooner or later, they will appoint the right Fed chairman to monetize those deficits. But a one, a one and a half to two percent <coughs> inflation rate would, you know, not be the sort of thing that would alarm anybody. No, I, that's that. I mean, we'd be quite pleased with that historically. Exactly. No, no. To me, the, the bigger issue, the bigger issues are first just the fact that they view inflation as something they might use to combat unemployment, then that could be extrapolated farther. But I, I don't view the Fed as an institution as the main risk. I view Congress and the President as the main risk. Because? They're going to, they're going to continue spending. We're currently on a path where the present value of government uh, uh, obligations, promises, is uh, taking us to six times GDP levels of debt. Inclusive of Medicare, Social Security? Yes. So we're, we're looking at a 600 to 700 percent of GDP government debt. We know that where we already are is close to the unsustainable point. 90 to 100 percent for the U.S. is probably an, uh, about the maximum sustainable. So we are in a very dire situation, and we need to think about drastic and immediate cuts in expenditure. Can I just come back to you and ask what your perspective is on, on that question? If the mic's going to come to you. I get beaten up a lot because uh, I think it's quite likely we can have an order of magnitude higher inflation than you just discussed, um, simply because um, I'm a mathematician, not a psychiatrist, but I think that there will come a single trading day when every bond trader in the world will simultaneously realize that every other bond trader realizes that the emperor's not wearing any clothes, the government of the United States cannot afford to pay interest on the national debt in real money, and on that day, They'll all sell their debt ahead of the next person, and we'll get a 10% spike in a day. Unfortunately, that will precipitate other shoes falling, like there's a whole lot of insurance companies out there that by a quirk of accounting that I've discovered uh, are not being declared insolvent. When I wrote a paper and I predicted in 2008 that 20% of all the retail stores in the United States would close in 2009. Unfortunately, they did. But then I said we're going to have a wave of commercial real estate defaults followed by a wave of bank and insurance company defaults. And think of each person as a consumer, an investor, and an employee. If they start worrying about losing their job, they stop consuming or stop investing in but checking accounts, then companies can't get work and process inventory financing and they can't sell their output. So you get a spiral. And I'm afraid if we start seeing Allstate and uh, you know, John Hancock going bankrupt and people's life insurance disappearing, uh, that we could see some very severe behavior where poverty becomes a self-funding prophecy. I want to be poor in consumption, so I become poor in consumption because everybody gets laid off. And that's very difficult to stop. Okay. Uh, well, I think um, I'm getting depressed now. So I want to... Uh, <laughs> this is about global creative leadership here. I, I want one each of to finish on. I think we need the, each panelist to come up with one positive thing that they see about the, the future. And Paul, can you come up with anything that... You're looking at the future and feeling positive about? That's not in my nature. It's just, <laughs> I'm just, a, a, for whatever reason, I've always been um, uh, pessimistic. I, somebody said that, um, that, that one's future happiness, it was a great, great quote, if anyone can remind me who it was, one's, one's future happiness depends upon you being pessimistic now, you know, avoiding all the bad things. And I'm just... <laughs> Delayed gratification or something. Oh, that's very, that, that, that is so important. Yeah, it's, it, people say <laughs> delayed gratification is a, a sign of maturity. I remember when I was a, a little boy and I had these little fairy cakes when I was about four years old. There was a little sweet on the top. I was, used to religiously take the little sweet off, put on the mantelpiece, eat the cake, and then come back to the sweet uh, hours later. That was my, my little treat. You don't see enough delayed gratification in this business. <laughs> Josh? I, you know, two quotes that our entrepreneurs live by. One, I gave you earlier, which was that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And the other is that the future is here, it's just unevenly distributed. It is concentrated in the minds of the brilliant scientists and entrepreneurs, and I think it behooves us morally as a society to make sure that the resources, the capital, the talent flows towards those people. And so I am hugely optimistic when you look at the pipeline of the things in our portfolio self-servingly, but broadly amongst our peers and competitors of venture capital, the labs at MIT, Harvard, Caltech, Cornell, it is astounding what none of you realize is on the path and you look just five years ago at what didn't exist that does today from Facebook, Twitter, iPads. Some of these may seem trivial to you. Some of them have profound social technological implications. Five years from now, you will be woe to predict how great your life is. Life will continue to improve despite the vicissitudes and volatility of capital markets. That's more like it. Charles, come on. Oh, I, oh, I completely agree with that. I'm an optimist. I think that the, that the history proves that, that what uh, Josh just said is correct. And uh, 
and I'm also optimistic because we know that of the various stages of dealing with crises, the first one you have to get past is denial. And I think that there is this collective consensus now that is pushing us in the direction of dealing with some problems head on. Then we go to anger and bargaining and depression. <laughs> we still have a few more. But uh, I, combined with your vision, which I share, I'm very optimistic. Uh, and I have, I have faith in people. Uh, if the creative uh, instincts of people are allowed to thrive, and, uh, but, and I think we're heading in, in that direction long term. I hope so. And James, you're going to talk about Africa, but why don't you just pick one specific story within that that you, um, you think isn't under, is underappreciated at the moment? Well, I think uh, Africa is the next emerging market um, um, story that's going to be for uh, 10, 15 years uh, after China and India have peaked. In India will go before Africa. Uh, China has peaked. And incomes will more than double in Africa in the next decade. So the pessimism about Africa is, uh, is going to be um, uh, defied by, by what's the, the, the momentum that has been unleashed. What you talked about, energy. Uh, one of the advantages that Africa has, it doesn't have a legacy um, that will resist change. You don't have um, huge companies with investments that have to be uh, written off. Uh, look at the, techno the telecommunications revolution in Africa cell phone technology is more advanced, cheaper, more efficient in Africa than here uh, because they don't have a legacy and an interest to protect. The same thing is going to happen in energy. Um, the technology will be developed here, uh, and as you mentioned, uh, this is not the market where there'll be a billion people that could use low, efficient technology, and energy is, is going to be the next driver in Africa. Well, I hope you're right, and I think on that positive note, um, I'd like to thank the panel for covering a wider amount of territory and, and giving us plenty of food for thought. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.